My apologies. Um, I was just thanking Doron, which I will now do uh, once again for, for reminding me about that. Um, thank you very much to the National Library of Israel for inviting me to give the talk this evening. And thank you to all of you from around the world for joining me, um, for joining me tonight. Um, as you heard, my name is Dr. Rachel First. Um, I am a research fellow and lecturer at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, Germany. Um, I wanna, before I begin, um, actually use the opportunity to thank my colleagues on one of the main research projects that I engage here in Munich. Um, it is a project that is sponsored by the German Israeli Foundation um, entitled Rabbinic Responsa and Archival Records from Medieval Ashkenaz in Legal and Cultural Conversation. And I especially want to thank my colleague, Dr. Sophia Schmidt, um, who has worked very closely on the research that you're going to be hearing, uh, the materials that I'm going to be presenting tonight, um, really in a way, um, these ideas are hers as well as my own. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Um, I've entitled my presentation tonight, um, hold on one moment, let me just get that into presentation mode. Okay, um, so my presentation tonight, um, which I entitled Next Door Neighbors, Jewish Christian Legal Encounters in Medieval Ashkenaz, um, will be an opportunity to talk about um, the ways in which Jews and Christians, um, some of the ways in which Jews and Christians interacted um, in the period at hand. Um, but I wanna begin um, by noting that in 1840, Heinrich Heine published in serial form, the first sections of a novel that he had begun to write two decades earlier, um, which he called the Rabbi of Bachrach. It was set in the 15th century, but crafted in accordance with the tastes of 19th century romanticism. And his tale focuses on a fictional Rabbi Abraham and his wife, the beautiful Sarah, who flee their hometown on the Rhine late one Passover night to escape an impending blood libel. Though it was never completed and it is not considered one of Heine's finest works, um, nonetheless, this novel is significant for its portrayal of medieval Jewish life and particularly for its depiction of the Frankfurt Judengasse or Jewish alley, where the couple arrive after a night long journey down the river. When they reached the famed Jewish neighborhood, which was separated from the rest of a city by a desolate empty place, according to Heine, the protagonists are confronted with high walls and an imposing gate that is locked with iron chains and that was meant to shut off their co-religionists from the mob. To enter, they have to appeal to soldiers of the municipality who controlled the population's comings and goings from a watch house that was adjacent to the gate. And here Heine writes, Frankfurt's Jews lived crowded and oppressed with far more vivid memories of previous sufferings than at present. Now, Heine's evocative description of the 15th century Judengasse was based loosely on the Frankfurt ghetto of the early modern period and on the vestiges of that neighborhood that he was able to visit in his own day. Um, in its pathos as well as in its details, Heine's representation is in line with the historical approaches, the historical approach of his contemporaries, some of the early proponents of Wissenschaftsstudentums, the science of Judaism. Enamored by the literary flair and the supposed worldliness of medieval Sephardic Jewry, these 19th century scholars scorned the Ashkenazic Jews of Northern Europe as pious and backwards, as a people whose cultural endeavors and intellectual pursuits were restricted, as far as they were concerned, to Talmud study and prayer, and very eager to dissociate themselves with this heritage and to forge what they considered a new and enlightened European Jewish image. These scholars, these Wissenschaft scholars, portrayed the pre-modern Jewish experience in Northern Europe as insular and closed off from the general environment, um, as characterized by passive suffering and punctuated by an unending series of persecutions. 
Despite the efforts of more recent scholarship to challenge this lacrimose assessment of medieval Ashkenazi Jewry, the work of Heine and his contemporaries has cast a long shadow. Um, and indeed, in popular imagination, the crowded and controlled and sealed ghetto is one of the enduring images of Jewish life in pre-modern Europe. I must say that historians themselves have contributed to this perception by using the terms ghetto, Jewish quarter, and Jewish neighborhood somewhat indiscriminately. In point of fact, however, ghettos as such did not exist until the 16th century. And in the vast majority of towns in the medieval German empire, Jews were not forced to live in segregated walled off areas. Even Frankfurt, which was the exception to the rule, did not mandate compulsory residential separation until, 14, until 1462, so mid 15th century. And for much of the Middle Ages, the so-called Jewish quarters of German municipalities were in fact mixed neighborhoods in which Jews and Christians lived side by side um, and sometimes in the same physical structures. In the words of the historian Benjamin Ravid, all ghettos were Jewish quarters, but not all Jewish quarters were ghettos. Now, to be sure, the Jewish residents of medieval German towns and cities did tend to live in relatively close proximity to one another, often in a few interconnected streets. In some cases, these streets had gates that could be locked or unlocked by the residents themselves. Um, and just as one example, I'll show you here the map, a map of the Jewish quarter of Cologne from before 1349. Now I know this map is a bit hard to decipher in its current size, um, but the most important thing for our purposes is to note all of the pink areas are Jewish residences and all of the mint green or light blue as it appears and may appear on your screen, all of those areas are in fact Christian buildings or Christian residences. Um, and I want to particularly point out, you can see my cursor over this large building here on the right side. This is in fact the Cologne Town Hall, which means that the city council members had to enter the Cologne, the, the town hall through the Jewish neighborhood, through the Jewish quarter. Um, you'll also know these blue gates that appear at the end of the major streets through this quarter. Um, these were gates that were controlled by the Jewish residents themselves. Um, and in fact, in 1340, there, the uh, council members, the Cologne council members came to an agreement with the Jewish residents, um, made them promise not to lock the neighborhood gates before they had exited the town hall. Um, now, Nonetheless, you can see that despite the fact that there are, again, this is a mixed neighborhood with Jewish and Christian residents, um, you can still see that the pink areas um, represent a preponderance of Jewish or a clustering of Jewish residences. This arrangement in Cologne and in elsewhere did have several advantages for the Jews. Um, first and foremost, it enabled them to participate fully in communal life, since communal institutions like the synagogue, the mikvah, the community hall, which again, you could see if the image were a bit larger, um, and the hostel for guests, among others, were all located in this area. Um, in some cities, it enabled the Jewish residents to set up an Eruv, um, as in Cologne, within whose boundaries they were allowed to transport items in Sh on Shabbat. And clustered living also offered protection from occasional acts of violence that were directed at the Jewish community. But the point is that in virtually all cases prior to the mid 14th century, Jewish neighborhoods were not exclusively Jewish. And even during later periods, when most of these neighborhoods did house only Jews, the fact that they were often very centrally located, um, that they bordered on other residential areas, and that they were, many of them were not locked and sealed, certainly not from the outside, 
continued to bring Jewish and Christian residents of the city into regular daily contact with one another. Um, the physical proximity between Jewish and Christian residences in medieval towns carried very significant implications for social and cultural relations between groups and individuals, as well as the, for the application and negotiation of what I'll be focusing on tonight, legal standards and norms. Living alongside one another meant that Jews and Christians were exposed to one another's life cycle events, as well as to one another's religious practices, to mundane moments, as well as to extraordinary ones. Sharing urban space meant that like neighbors anywhere, they sometimes got caught up in everyday conflicts over blocked drainage, obstructed light, smelly cooking, and in attempting to resolve these neighborhood disputes, which could be adjudicated according to both Jewish and German Christian law, Jews and Christians also came into contact with each other's distinct legal systems. These quotidian interactions, as Ephraim Schoham Steiner has dubbed them, constituted a far larger percentage of medieval Jewish Christian relations than the occasional incidents of violence and aggression that tend to dominate accounts of religious interaction. But despite historians turn to what we might call microhistory or Alltagsgeschichte in recent decades, and their ever more concerted attempts to uncover the history of the so-called non-elite, neighborly relations between Jews and Christians remains an under-examined uh, under facet of medieval European history. And so what I'd like to do in my lecture tonight is to focus on one set of sources that allows us to see these Jewish Christian neighborhood interactions up close. Um, and that is legal documents of different natures that showcase disputes over the rights to light, to air, to privacy in the very densely packed Jewish or Jewish Christian neighborhoods of medieval German towns. This will be an opportunity to consider how Jews and Christians dealt with the overlapping legal as well as social and cultural spheres that they inhabited and how their legal negotiations impacted and even shaped the neighborhoods in which they lived. Now, I'm going to be focusing on the medieval German empire, as I said, and I just want to um, say a word about what I mean by that. Um, this map that you have before you, which shows some of the Jew which shows the major Jewish settlements um, around the year 1200. Um, and you can see the pink um, outlines uh, more or less the German empire of the medieval period. Um, the very first individual Jewish families that we can trace settled in um, this area, uh, probably in the ninth century, maybe a little bit earlier. In, um, and the establishment of traceable recorded communities um, really dates to the late 10th, 11th century. Um, and we're going to be looking at the, what I somewhat sometimes is called the high middle ages, the period that spans through the major migrations and changes that followed the black death of the mid 14th century um, and into really the beginnings of the 15th. Now, sometime in the 1270s or perhaps 1280s, Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rottenburg, who was one of the foremost Jewish legal authorities in the German empire, issued a ruling on what was ostensibly a rather mundane property dispute. A man who was called Reuben in the, in the sources owned a home in an unspecified German town and he had open windows in a wall that overlooked his Christian neighbor's property. And again, think back to that map of the uh, Jewish quarter of Cologne, and you can understand how this might have taken place. Um, sometime later, the Christian neighbor sold the said property to another Jew who was called Simeon, again, as far as the sources are concerned. Simeon was not pleased with Reuben's direct line of vision into his new property, 
as he felt that it violated his privacy. And he demanded that Rubin block up the openings. Rubin refused. He insisted that he had pre-established rights to the light and to the air that his windows provided, which was a very valuable commodity in the increasingly crowded medieval cities. Now, in his response to this neighborly squabble, Rabbi Meir recognized Simeon's rights to privacy, and he dismissed Rubin's counter arguments, asserting that Rubin had not acquired the right to maintain his windows either by Jewish law or by local German law. Nevertheless, he advised his questioners that Simeon would have to remedy the situation himself and he could not force his neighbor to reverse his actions. More specifically, he ruled that Simeon could not compel Reuben to block up the windows himself, but he could build a wall at the edge of his own property that effectively restricted Reuben's vision. And he was allowed to do this, even if in the course of so doing, he deprived Reuben and his household of the light and air that they desired. Um, and I wanna take a look at the text that you have in front of you, a selection, um, a paragraph from this responsum by Rabbi Meir. What did the non-Jew sell to Simeon? He, he asks, all the rights that he had regarding his property. And so just like the non-Jew could have built a wall and thereby darkened his, meaning Reuben's windows, Simeon himself can now do the same. However, he cannot force Reuben to make the effort to block up the windows himself, although he could have done so if Reuben had purchased the property from a fellow Jew. A Jew who purchases from a non-Jew is like the non-Jew. And the non-Jew who sold to him would not have been able to force Reuben to make the effort himself to block them up, for it is not so according to their, meaning German or Christian law. Rather, if the non-Jew wants, he builds a wall opposite him. Behold, he is like the non-Jew and no more. Now, a careful reading of the, uh, the entire responsum by Rabbi Meir reveals that it was guided by Jewish legal tradition. Yet strikingly, it also demonstrates a familiarity with, and I would even say a grudging respect for local German law. When a Jew purchases property from a non-Jew, Rabbi Meir argues, legal norm, local legal norms, rather than halacha or Jewish law, become the relevant standard for determining the rights of the two now Jewish neighbors. Local German law did not allow one neighbor to prevent the other from opening windows unless he formally purchased the right to do so. But it did allow each property owner to build whatever he wished within his own property. And this rule, Rabbi Meir asserted, would apply to the subsequent Jewish neighbors as well. Now, Jewish legal texts, such as the responsum uh, in which Rabbi Meir's ruling was recorded, are very valuable sources for reconstructing the living situations and the daily experiences of the largely urban Jewish population of the medieval German empire. Most of the rabbinic responsa and other uh, records of neighborly disputes that have been preserved relate to everyday disagreements that arose when one member of the local population undertook a construction project that did not meet with his neighbor's approval. Sounds familiar to many of us. Yet in addition to showcasing the regulation of building construction in practice, these sources also provide evidence for the spatial layout of Jewish neighborhoods, including the proximity that we've seen of Jewish residences to Christian homes. And Furthermore, as testimony to the ways in which Jewish authorities and lay people navigated ordinary but frequently fraught interactions between neighbors, Jewish and Christian, they also offer very critical insight, I would argue, into the medieval concept of neighborly relations. The fact that in this case at hand, Simeon's desire for privacy from his neighbor's prying eyes and Reuben's desire for unobstructed access to light and air 
became a point of contention only after the former Christian neighbor had stepped aside does not imply that privacy and light were of particular value to Jews. Indeed, German legal texts from the era, as we'll see, demonstrate that these commodities were of similar significance to Christian residents of medieval towns. Um, and just to give you a sense of why this might be so, um, here are some photos that I took through a walk of my own uh, through a medieval neighborhood in York, England, um, not Germany, but I think nonetheless very similar to what we would have, you would have seen in a medieval German town. You can see the very densely packed buildings um, sort of jutting out um, different layers. Um, and this is partially why these disputes over light, air, and privacy become particularly contentious. Um, archival sources, as we're going to see, especially court records and other administrative documents, further highlight some of the contentious roles of windows in urban environments, including encounters between Jewish and Christian residents and legal spheres. Um, nonetheless, juxtaposing the Jewish sources like the one that we saw with these local German records confirms the distinction between Jewish and German law that Rabbi Mayer articulated. It turns out he knew what he was talking about. Jewish law contains extensive regulations pertaining to the rights and obligations of neighbors, including those that govern building construction in general and the opening of windows in specific. Underlying the rules that are outlined and discussed in the Talmud is the assumption that a person has a right to be protected from his or her neighbor's gaze. Um, this right restricts individuals from making structural changes to their own property in a manner that threatens their neighbor's privacy. Yet Jewish law also recognizes an individual's right to light and by extension air, and is aware that it might conflict with the former, with the privacy. The Talmud and later law codes provide instruction as to how to navigate some of these situations. So according to the Mishnah, which is the oldest strata of Talmudic law in Tractate Bava Batra, in a courtyard which he shares with others, a person should not open a door facing another person's door, nor a window facing another person's window. If it's small, he should not enlarge it, and he should not turn one into two. On the side of a public thoroughfare, however, he may make a door facing another person's door and a window facing another person's window. And if it is small, he may enlarge it or he may make two out of one. It's a distinction between uh, two buildings facing one another in the private sphere and those um, that face a public thoroughfare where it's understood that more people will be gazing. Commenting on a related passage that prohibits the building of a wall too close to the pre-existing wall of a neighbor's house, the Babylonian Talmud, um, also here in Tractate Bava Batra comments, if there are windows in the neighbor's wall, he must leave a clear space of four cubits, arba amot is the Talmudic term, whether above or below or opposite. And in a Baraita commenting on this, it is stated that a space must be left above so that he should not be able to peep into the other one's room and below so that he should not stand on tiptoe and look in and opposite so that he should not take away his light. That is to say, if built in a manner that does not comply with Talmudic recommendations, the windows and doorways in a person's home might well be a threat to her neighbor's propriety insofar as they provide a direct line of vision into the abutting or adjoining homes. Although as we've seen, the Talmudic rules were not the only ones that informed the decisions of medieval Jewish legalists, this heritage unquestionably guided the attempts of Jewish judges to resolve similarly, similar neighborly disputes throughout the period um, that we're talking about, throughout the medieval period. Now, in contrast to Jewish law, 
Medieval German law did not in principle regulate the rights and obligations associated with neighborly relations. Um, classical Roman law, which inspired much of late medieval Western legal thought, included various legal servitudes that pertain to windows and light. In other words, it required property owners to comply with certain restrictions to their own rights in order to protect their neighbor's rights. But these concepts were first integrated into German town ordinances during the 15th century in the context of a more general and relatively late reception of Roman law in German lands. So there, thus, for example, um, it wasn't until 1479 that the city of Nuremberg issued regulations that prohibited individuals from opening windows in pre-existing structures that overlooked neighboring properties. And according to the regulations, these windows had to be blocked up unless they were already in place for at least 30 years. That being said, it's also the case that some versions of the 13th century Sachsenspiegel, uh, an important German law book, did contain a rule prohibiting the construction of windows that overlooked a neighbor's courtyard. And similarly, some town statutes from this earlier period, particularly for municipalities in the Northeast region of the empire, included regulations that pertained to the rights to light and air in specific neighborhoods. Um, However, in the medieval German empire, issues that were um, concerned building construction and structural changes that were not addressed by these very rudimentary and local regulations were usually negotiated on a case by case basis, often in the context of house sales. Specific provisions um, would sometimes be written into the sales contract and thereby established legal precedent for use in the later adjudication of disputes that might arise between neighbors, including those that followed a subsequent sale or transfer of ownership. As town residents, and, and by the way, um, I just wanted to show you now from Germany, um, these are again some pictures that I took on a walk of my own from this, the town of Rodenberg ob der Tauber, um, where you can see a little bit of what these medieval windows looked like. Um, they were oftentimes closed by wooden shutters. Um, they were sometimes covered by sort of um, porous material. Um, glass was used um, very rarely, certainly in private residences during the period under discussion. Um, so they really did let in not only light and air, um, but sometimes unwanted um, sounds, smells, etc. as well. Now, as town residents, Jews were not strangers to the German practices that I just described. Um, they also drew up these kinds of contracts, again, oftentimes in the context of house sales, um, and particularly when they engaged in real estate transactions that involved their Christian neighbors. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, an example of this practice is on display in another ruling that was issued by the very same Rabbi Mayer of Rothenburg. Um, again, during the la latter half of the 13th century, um, and in response to a property dispute that had arisen under circumstances very similar to the ones in the first case that I mentioned. In this second case, which might have occurred in Würzburg or its environs, a man named or called Simeon purchased property from Reuben's Christian neighbor. In the course of the transaction, the Christian presumably told Simeon that he was selling him not only the property, but also his own rights to build within his property in a manner that would obstruct Reuben's windows at any point that he might choose to do so. Following the sale, Simeon came to, the local, to a local Jewish court headed by the judge, Rabbi Menachem ben David, and he demanded that Reuben block up the windows that overlooked his newly acquired property. Now, as per the, uh, the question that appears in front of you, to strengthen his case, Simeon brought along a Latin document 
Uh, and the, the Hebrew terminology is a ktav pasul, a, an invalid document, a bit of um, rhetoric against uh, Latin Christian documents. But the point is that he brought along a Latin document. Um, you can see here in the middle of this um, question with the seal of the city council that was given to him at the time of his purchase by the former Christian owner. This document stated explicitly that the Christian had not sold his neighbor Reuben the rights to light and air. Now, Reuben contested Simeon's claim by arguing that he had constructed the windows more than three years earlier, which constituted a halachic or Jewish legal chazaka, meaning a legally established claim, because the Christian neighbor had never complained about their existence. Right, and let's just take a quick look at this document. To the one who has a light on him, like Moses, peace, our teacher, Rabbi Meir, eyes of the exile. Right? So this is the letter that's being written to Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg by, again, the local judge, Rabbi Menachem ben David, probably in the area of Würzburg. Enlighten me regarding the matter of Reuben, who had a house abutting the non-Jew, and he opened windows in it illegally. For the law of the non-Jews is that one may build on his own property whatever he wants. Right, so illegally meaning according to Jewish law, because the law of the non-Jews is that one may build on his own property whatever he wants. And even if they opened windows facing him for several years, he could block them when he wished, for he would simply build in front of them within his own property. And now the non-Jew went and sold his house to Simeon. He said to him at the time of the sale, you may build in front of Reuben's windows whenever you like. And he wrote this for him in a Latin document with the seal of the city council. Right? And, and now they came to court and Simeon said, block up the windows. And Reuben responded, these windows were already facing the non-Jew for more than the requisite years needed to establish a legal precedent. And Simeon responded, that precedent is no precedent for the reason that the non-Jew remained silent, meaning that the non-Jew did not protest, is because according to their law, he could wait until he wanted with his building. And furthermore, it's a precedent with a legally valid claim because I have the document, right? So in other words, we have two Jews here in a Jewish court locked in a dispute about their conflicting desires, their conflicting property rights, one of whom is arguing that according to Jewish law, his now Jewish neighbor has no right to obstruct his heir and his light. And the other arguing that according to local German law, and particularly in accordance with this Latin document that he has brought into the Jewish court, he has every right to do exactly that. Now, when consulted by the local judges, Rabbi Meir, who was uh, one of the, again, the foremost legal authorities of the era, Rabbi Meir ruled that Simeon could not force Reuben to block up the windows that he had opened because according to the local legal norms that had been in force at the time of their construction, Reuben was acting within his rights. And I want to uh, take a look at, again, the, this response that you have before you. I will answer you, Rabbi Meir writes, according to my humble opinion, that Simeon, Simeon cannot force Reuben to block up his windows, for he is no better than anyone else who purchases them. And in accordance with the Talmud, one who purchases from a non-Jew is like the non-Jew. And because the non-Jew would not have been able to force him to block them up, for according to their law, everyone may do in his property whatever he desires, Simeon too, who purchased from him, is not any better. Rather, Simeon may build in his property, i.e. in front of uh, Reuben's windows, and block Reuben's lights, light. For Reuben is not claiming that he acquired the light rights from the non-Jew. Rather, he's making a claim that has no legal validity and is not worth anything. In this case, it is the law of the land that a person does not ever establish a legal precedent regarding rights to the light, whether it's non-Jew to non-Jew or non-Jew or Jew, excuse me, to non-Jew, and there is no corrective other than with a document that he has acquired from the non-Jew, meaning if Reuben had acquired a document that stated quite the opposite of what Simeon's document actually did. 
So in other words, Rabbi Meir here is asserting that this is a case where Dina de Malchuta Dina, as the halachic term goes, the law of the land, was applicable from a halachic perspective. And unless Reuben had a document of his own to demonstrate that he purchased the light rights from his former non-Jewish neighbor, he can't claim them now from his Jewish co-religionists, right? He can't suddenly um, call up halacha. Here too, like in the previous case we saw, Rabbi Meir's ruling demonstrates a very detailed knowledge of local law. And his response here refers to actually two distinct types of documents that could be used to establish the rights of property owners. Um, and his legal argument actually takes all of these into conclusion, uh, into consideration, excuse me. The first document that Rabbi Meir alluded to Right, the one that Simeon brought into the Jewish court um, was a document issued by the former Christian owner at the time of the property sale. And it was essentially an appendix to the house sale itself. Now, the archival collections that, that exist demonstrate that there is in fact, this type of document was in fact used in the context of house sales, both private and communal, between Christians and Jews, as well as among Christians throughout the period under discussion. So just by way of example, um, in 1375, municipal authorities in Frankfurt confirmed that the Christian, Konrad zu Lovenstein, sold a house to the Jew, Fiveline of Dieburg, that was located next to Conrad's own home. And the German sale contract, we have the original on the right, that is today preserved in the Institute for Stadtgeschichte in Frankfurt, contains several clauses that prohibit Conrad and future owners from introducing changes to the structure of the neighboring building. In other words, the one that remains in his possession. So as the document states, we, the mayor, judges, and council of Frankfurt officially declare with this letter that Conrad of Lovenstein, our colleague and fellow councilman, is standing in front of us and declares that he sold and handed his house and estate, which is currently inhabited by Jostlin of Marburg, to the Jew Fivlin of Dieburg. With regard to the shared wall next to the well, neither the neighbor, neither neighbor should build a structure that would block the other's light. Neither Conrad nor any other owner of the stone house should open windows, lights, or doors that might disturb Fivillin or his heirs or any other owner of the aforementioned house. The doors and windows that are currently facing toward Fivillin should be sealed up by Conrad. Um, now, some, in contrast to this particular document, there are also other documents that stipulate that the new owner must implement certain structural changes. Um, while others describe this, that they must maintain the status quo of the buildings that they purchased. Um, but the point is that we can assume that in, by including such clauses in sales contracts, um, this was a fairly standard practice as the documents of this nature that have survived in archival collections um, likely represent only a small sampling of those that were actually issued. Nevertheless, court records and the response of themselves suggest that these kinds of documents were not always effective in preventing or averting the conflicts that they were designed to avoid, um, again, as, as we all probably are familiar with from our own legal situation. Um, and I just, just to give you a sort of visual sense of, of this, um, what you have here before you, this is not the document that we just read, but it's an arbitration agreement between the Jew Hesman and a Christian religious order from March 1378 um, in Wien. Um, it refers to a, again, it's an arbitration agreement that refers to a sort of multi-layered property dispute between this Jew Hesman and the Christian religious order whose property his own abutted. Um, and in the course of this, um, this particular arbitration agreement that was issued by the Wiener Stadtrat, um, it assured, um, again, this was a multi-layered property dispute, um, it assured Hesman the right to add a toilet into his courtyard, but it in fact um, ruled that he was not allowed to open another window into the court, the shared courtyard in the course of his building renovations. And this is the kind of document that someone like Hesman would have probably held onto um, in order to use in the future as proof 
for the building rights that he had acquired. Um, now, although Jewish law, as we discussed, does regulate building construction in accordance with much more generalized rules and guidelines, we also know that medieval Jews themselves sometimes drew up documents that very much resembled these individualized contractual agreements that were used by their Christian neighbors. Um, and the Judenschreinsbuch, which is a very unique register of Jewish real estate transactions in medieval Cologne again, contains several such examples. Um, the image that you have before you is um, a sample image, a sample deed for a house sale from 1281. Um, it's not the one that I am going to discuss because the one that I'm going to discuss uh, was damaged and the image is unreadable. Um, but this is what the Hebrew document, which was attached in, in, this particular, in this unique book, which was attached to a Latin version, a Latin document. Um, this is what roughly what it would have looked like. Now, one, partic the, one particularly relevant entry for our purposes is from also from 1281, and it refers to the purchase of two thirds of a house by Simeon Bar Jacob and his wife Hannah from a woman named Guttheil and her sons. Um, the sale, as again, as I said, it was recorded in parallel Hebrew and Latin documents. And again, the Hebrew documents were usually drawn up before a Jewish law court, um, and the Latin documents were presumably prepared for the records of the St. Lawrence Parish on the basis of these Hebrew originals. Now, the Hebrew document, as well as the Latin one, both contain explicit provisions for the windows of the house in question. And it's presented in a manner that really brings, very much brings to mind the contemporaneous German sales contracts that we have been discussing. Um, after clarifying the boundaries of the relevant property by identifying the neighbors in all directions, both Jews and Christians, they specify that the house actually had 16 windows on one side and 19 windows on the other. Sounds a little uh, hard to imagine, but again, we know that light and air were important commodities. And it emphasizes that the sale contained pertained to the house with all of its windows. Um, and the documents then assert that the purchaser was granted the rights to maintain these windows and that the neighbors of the said property were not allowed to build opposite these windows, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, while most archival sources that pertain to windows and light document these kinds of private agreements between neighbors, um, some also do refer to um, rights that were granted by local authorities. In other words, not private agreements between neighbors, but ones that were granted by the authorities. And here is just another example um, of a deed that was issued to the Jew Anselm of Osnabrück, who we know elsewhere as, uh, as actually a scholar, um, that was issued to him by the city council of Cologne between 1328 and 1330. Um, and he was allowed by the city council to lay a beam in one of his walls in order to reinforce the structure of the town hall, uh, excuse me, he allowed the city to put a beam in one of his walls in order to reinforce the structure of the town hall, which bordered his property. And in the privilege, as we saw in that original um, Cologne map, and in the privilege that the council granted him, they explicitly allowed the opening of doors and windows in the direction of the street in exchange. Now, as we noted, neither the responsa nor the documentary evidence that has survived suggests that the lines of sight that were afforded by open windows were cause for particular concern between Jewish and Christian neighbors, right? Indeed, both of the rulings that we saw by Rabbi Mayer of Rotenberg refer to conflicts that arose specifically when property sales made neighbors of two co-religionists, two Jews. And they recorded agreements between Jews and Christians that pertain to opening windows as frequently as to closing them. Nevertheless, several cases concerning windows that overlooked communal spaces of a more religious nature, as opposed to a private one, suggest that the preservation of boundaries between Jews and Christians in this context were perhaps more of a concern than in the private one. So in 14th century Ulm, for example, 
the Jewish community was in possession of a document that was issued by a Christian citizen of the town whose name was Kraft, whose family owned significant sections of the Jewish quarter following the temporary expulsion of the city's Jewish community in 1349. So the deed that we're talking about, which was issued in 1354, um, in that deed, Kraft affirmed the community's previous purchase of the right to prevent him or any subsequent owners of his property that bordered the Jewish synagogue from opening new windows into the synagogue court courtyard or the so-called the so Schulhof. And this document was apparently issued when Kraft did in fact sell his property to a fellow Christian. And what's particularly interesting is that it bears a very brief Judeo-Christian label on its backside that reads, as you see here in front of you, über die Licht und Fenster von der näheren Zattlerin Haus mit darum the base Hakneses. Right, and what's particularly important for our purposes is that it, it, it's the, the, this mark on the backside, this Judeo-Christian uh, note, points out that the value of the document is that it is about the light and the windows from this um, courtyard that was in on the uh, on the south side of the Beit Knesset of the synagogue. The fact that the Jewish community took pains to acquire and preserve this affirmation of its rights, not to mention the fact that it was willing to purchase those rights to begin with, suggests that limiting visual and other direct access to synagogue environment, environs was fairly important to its members. And some other documents that we have that also pertain to Jewish and Christian institutional structures and uh, the desire to prevent um, members of the opposite religion from opening windows into these institutional areas, again, suggest that perhaps there is something um, that is a little bit different about uh, the neighborly relations between Jews and Christians and, uh, as I said, religious property of a religious nature, but that's something that um, I believe requires a little bit more examination. Um, before I conclude, I wanted to just um, show you this uh, photo that I really love of the old synagogue in Erfurt, whose oldest windows the rose window that you see in the, in the center and those um, sort of pointed windows along its sides do date to the late 13th century, so very much to the period under discussion. Um, you can see here that in addition to all these different windows, um, some of them are in fact boarded up, um, perhaps in the manner of uh, the requests that we have been reading about um, during some of these neighborly disputes. Now, in the sources that we have surveyed, rabbinic and archival alike, um, these, these sources provide very striking evidence, I would submit, for the deep embeddedness of Jews and Christians in medieval urban spaces throughout the period in question. So prior to the mid 14th century, and to recap, Jews were not living in closed ghettos, and the so-called Jewish quarters were often mixed neighborhoods in which Jews and Christians were literally next door, or perhaps we should say next window neighbors. Indeed, in some of the cases that we examined, Jewish and Christian residents even shared physical structures. The fact that there was no exclusive or sealed off Jewish residential space in medieval towns during this era meant that Jews and Christians came into daily contact in economic, professional, social, and cultural contexts. And it also meant that Jews living in these quarters had to constantly negotiate intersec intersecting and overlapping legal spheres. That is to say, between Jews, halakha, or Jewish law, was the official norm in matters pertaining to neighborly interactions. Yet, as we've seen, Jews also utilize the norms of local German law in their dealings with Jewish as well as Christian neighbors. Rabbinic judges and legal authorities, including Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, acknowledged the legal pluralism that this entailed and sanctioned the use of German law, specifically when property switched from Christian to Jewish hands. 
In several of the cases that we considered, however, it was the litigants themselves who fought over which set of rules should apply. Their individual positions were motivated by a very keen legal sense of which legal standards would protect their interests in a given circumstance. And these disputes are thus a window into the legal knowledge of medieval Jews and Christians to their understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of the different legal systems. They're also a testament to the roles that law and religion played in establishing and maintaining the parameters of medieval neighborhoods and neighborly relations more broadly. The windows of their private residences as well as public buildings allowed the inhabitants of medieval towns quite literally to open and close points of access into their individual and communal lives. In dense urban environments, they also afforded opportunities to see, to hear, to smell, and thus to experience the lives of others. Not surprisingly, the windows that we have encountered in legal and administrative sources from this era served as portals of contact and occasional friction between neighbors of both religious persuasions. In the course of their negotiations, their attempts at dispute resolution, their navigation of legal terrain, Jews as well as Christians were active agents in determining the contours of their own frequently mixed neighborhoods. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments. Hi, right, thank you very much. Um, yes, there are uh, many questions. Okay. Um, first would be, I'm sorry, just one second. Um, Debbie asked, can I please ask, uh, when, uh, when you're talking about Christians, are you referring to people who were Lutherans as compared to Catholics? Okay, so this is a good question, but this is the period that we're discussing is um, prior to the Reformation. So everybody here is, I mean, th th those terms basically do not yet apply. Um, there is, no, there is not yet, no yet distinction between Catholics and Lutherans. Thank you very much. Um, Lawrence asked, to what extent does the principle of dinam de malchuta dina apply to the uh, Maharam's decision? Okay, so in the decision that we saw by Maharam, he actually invoked that principle um, as the reason why in this particular case, he allowed uh, or he ruled in favor of the disputant who had this Latin document, right? This document that he had acquired from his, from the, from the Christian seller or the, the, the Christian from whom he purchased property, um, why the Maharam allowed him to use that, the, the rights that he acquired in that document um, in his later negotiations with his, own, with his now Jewish, uh, his, his co-religionist, his new neighbor. So in other words, the Maharam uses the idea of the law of the land um, in order to argue that in these kinds of cases where Jews purchased property from Christians, halacha did not govern their relations, but rather local law, which as we have seen, um, operated according to different standards, local law was actually in force. Um, and again, to me, it's very, very striking in these, uh, in these documents, in these cases, the way in which Jewish decisors like Maharam, uh, like Rabbi Meir of Rodenberg, were very familiar with local German law, um, but that not only, not, not only that the scholars like Maharam were very familiar with the local German law, but clearly the uh, disputing neighbors were very familiar with it as well, um, and that they uh, were calling upon it in the cases where it served their own purpose, while well, obviously the, the disputant here um, believed that halakha was more to his advantage and therefore called on halakha. So in other words, I think that these cases um, show us very much um, the, the extent to which not only the scholars, but also ordinary individuals 
had the extent to which they had knowledge of these overlapping and intersecting um, yet very distinct legal systems. Thank you very much. Uh, Phyllis asked, how common were property agreements written in Hebrew? Who was uh, competent to write such agreements? Okay, so um, the proper, I mean, the, the one that I, uh, the one that I showed you, and perhaps I'll just move back to that particular slide. I, I imagine that you're referring um, or alluding to these deeds that I mentioned from the Judenschein's Buch of Cologne. Um, as I said, this is a very unique set of documents. Um, it, it may not have been unique um, in, in its in, in original, um, but it's unique in terms of what has survived because um, there are corresponding Hebrew and Latin documents here. Um, the Hebrew documents were drawn up before a Jewish Beit Din, a Jewish court, um, and they were presumably the originals, and they referred to property, um, property sales between Jews uh, for the most part. Um, and the Latin, again, what we assume are copies or later versions were prepared for the local parish in which the Jewish quarter was housed, who, who actually um, kept records of all of these house sales, all of these documents that, were, that occurred in the Jewish quarter of Cologne. Um, but to answer your question perhaps more directly, um, the, when Jews sold property to one another, it would not have been unusual for them to draw up Hebrew documents, Hebrew contracts, um, they probably would have done so before a local Jewish court. Um, that court might have been um, might have been led by scholars. It might have been led by local um, community leaders, and they would have drawn up these Hebrew documents. So I don't think it was not unusual in sales between Jews. Um, what is also interesting is that sometimes in sales between Jews and Christians, even when the documents that were drawn up um, were in Latin or in German, sometimes the signatures are actually, we do have cases where there are Hebrew signatures. Um, and that's perhaps a whole nother topic that, um, that some of my colleagues have explored, um, but that sort of multilingual, multilinguistic, multilingual documents um, where you have Hebrew signatures, um, and, and again, sort of the efficacy of a Hebrew signature, even on a Latin document is, a, again, sort of a separate but very interesting topic that perhaps relates to your question as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Catherine asked, uh, if a Jew lives in a house which has 16 windows, are we looking at the, a home of one of the Parnassim of the community? Is this a reflection of the wealth of the Jew? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, what I want to remind you is that um, in some of these sales contracts, people were, were buying and selling portions of houses, right? Sometimes they were selling a third of a house or even a fourth of a house or a sixth of a house. Um, so some of these houses, and again, if you think back to some of those photos that I showed you with you know, layers and levels built onto them, um, were multi-residential structures. So the fact that it had all of those windows did not necessarily indicate that it was one individual who was the owner of the entire house um, who was, you know, yes, would have uh, probably been wealthy. Um, but some of these, again, some of these were multi-residential um, multi structures um, and windows that were, again, just thinking back to that picture of the Cologne Synagogue, um, windows that had been built and opened at different periods of time by different residents. Thank you very much. There are many compliments in the chat room. I'll be sure to send you the transcripts. So you can read them yourself. Um, Lawrence asked, when did this kind of relationship stop and separation was more affirmatively, affirmatively affected? Okay, um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, the concept of you know, a ghetto as such, um, that is a, a secluded and closed off area, um, that's really, that's, that's, um, that dates to the 16th century. Again, I mentioned that Frankfurt um, already established that kind of um, restric restricted residential area in 1462, so late 15th century. Um, I do also want to mention that in Germany, um, in the German empire, by this period in time, um, so we're talking about late 15th, 16th century, Jews had been um, expelled from most of the major cities. There are a few exceptions and Frankfurt is one of them. 
Um, but Jews had actually been officially expelled from most of the major cities. Um, and to the extent that they continued to live in the German empire lived mostly um, in more rural areas in smaller um, villages, uh, did not live in the major cities. Um, and so in the German empire itself, there are select examples, but again, they pertain to really the early modern period and not to the medieval period that I have been discussing. Thank you very much. Lawrence also asked, is there any evidence that these kinds of day-to-day -day relationships led to more theoretical or scholarly exchanges or discour discourses? Discussion, sorry. Um, so that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, my own work um, and interests focus really on the, the ordinary individuals and their interactions trying to, again, we're, as historians, we're, we're always limited to the sources and the documents that have survived that exist for the work that we do. And it's very hard to trace um, the interactions and to trace the history in general of those who were not scholars. Um, where do they appear in the historical records, which are very, um, to a large extent, scholarly texts. Um, and again, that has been uh, perhaps what I've been getting after here. Um, but of course, um, there also were scholars. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, you're, if your question is as to whether there were, you know, sort of legal theoretical um, discussions between scholars about the kinds of um, the kinds of laws and legal theories perhaps that, that drove some of these um, different kinds of approaches to building regulation and whatnot. Um, I don't have a very direct answer for you. I don't know that they led to direct scholarly exchanges on those matters. Um, the question of scholarly exchange um, between Jewish and Christian scholars in Ashkenaz, I mean, there was there was a lot of polemic um, and there was definitely some exchange whether, it's a big question as to whether Jewish scholars um, read Latin and had access to the scholarly text. So um, I don't know, I, 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 I don't know whether to, an, uh, how to answer the question exactly. I'm not sure that these kinds of interactions led directly to scholarly exchanges on the subject matter. Thank you very much. There's one last question, but before uh, I ask, I just want to say thank you again to everybody for being here. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. First. And the question, uh, the last question will be, uh, what is the value of examining the different kinds of historical sources you, you've discussed, uh, rabbinic responsa versus various archival records? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you again for moderating this, uh, this panel. I'll say that just before I answer and we conclude. Um, so we've, we've looked at um, over the course of our, uh, over the course of my talk today, we've looked at different kinds of legal records. We've looked at um, rabbinic responsa. Um, we've looked at archival and documentary records of various natures. Um, and I think each of these different kinds of records really provides a different perspective onto, um, again, the specific disputes at hand um, and the legal knowledge, as I said, and the legal interactions of Jews and Christians in these cases. Um, but it also, they also highlight different aspects of what Jews and Christians knew and how Jews and Christians negotiated these different kinds of, um, these different kinds of legal spheres. Um, and I think that the responsa in particular, what we see, uh, excuse me, let me just backtrack for a moment, what we see in the archival sources um, are the different ways in which Jews were, they were active members of their local communities. Um, the Jews had building rights. Um, the Jews sometimes won their cases. They sometimes lost their cases. They um, affirmed their rights um, as much as they uh, lost them. Um, so they're very valuable in that kind, those records are very valuable in that kind of way. But one of the things that I find particularly compelling about the responsive that we've seen is that they really demonstrate the extent to which these individuals were negotiating different legal spheres in which they knew that they had these different legal options um, and which they, they, ch they picked and chose which of these kinds of um, rules and regulations were to their advantage. And their ability to do that um, is sometimes is something is something that we sometimes miss in our understanding of what the medieval Jewish experience was like, um, and that's something that I particularly hoped to highlight by juxtaposing some of these um, rabbinic sources 
um, together with the archival materials that we've seen. Thank you very, very much once more. Thank you all for being here with us. Hope to see you in our next events. The microphones are now open. Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. First. This is Ira Brandris speaking. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, it's it's a uh, Again, I miss being in the actual uh, reading room of the National Library in Jerusalem, but I have to say that being in this virtual reading room allows a lot more, uh, many more people to participate and uh, many more people to be, to be part of the National Library experience. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to all of you for attending. A very fascinating lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is Doris Ruiz Strauss. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again to everyone who is here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's really, I'm just, I'm scrolling through some of your photos, your, your pictures now it's, and names. It's fun to see all of you who are here. Hi, Rachel. I'm David. Hi <laughs> there. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for joining. Like I said, um, again, it's it's great to see everyone from all over the world. And I hope we'll have the pleasure of hearing you lecture again. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much for a fascinating yeah. lecture. Thank you. Thank you for the support. <laughs> okay. Good to know that there are some some actual Jerusalemites in the crowd. <laughs> I must say, I wish I were there myself instead of sitting in my apartment in Munich. But uh, but I'm glad to be able to participate virtually, to be there virtually. Next year in Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. I I have a question. Um, we <clears throat> listened a few days ago um, a lecture about. Um, um, the Jews in general, mm -hmm. um, and in the lecture there was a presentation of some um, friction among the Jews and disputes about um, um, trade um, commissions and so on. To what extent do you see a continuation of uh, the, the, what you presented today is like 200 years uh, earlier than, mm -hmm. uh, than um, the case of uh, the Jews is. Um, do you uh, think that uh, this kind of disputes among Jews in in the German Empire um, during the next 200 years from the times that you describe today has led to, to some decrease against the Jews? Ah, what a good question. Yeah, so um, I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't want to um, answer specifically with regards to Yudzus. Um, that's that's perhaps a question for Professor Minsker and not for myself. Um, you know, I'm I'm certainly not the expert on that. Um, and I would also say that as someone who focuses on the medieval period, it's a little bit hard for me to say how it translated into the the following period. Um, but I think that it is definitely a good question um, and one that is worth. I mean, as we as we study more about these kinds of interactions during the period that I'm focusing on, um, I think it's something that we could really um, try a little bit harder, perhaps. Um, to trace into the following period and to see whether these kinds of interactions between Jews and Christians had, you know, had, had long-term impacts. This is, what, this is the question that I think that you're um, yeah. asking um, in addition to the, you know, the contemporary impact that it had. Um, again, I was focusing more on the contemporary impact, um, the ways in which it is shaped in the medieval Jewish experience. Um, but I think that it's a good question to ask how that perhaps um, shaped the early modern or the later Jewish experience as well. Um, and that's something that, that would be worth um, continuing to look at. Yeah. 
I'd like to thank you. It's been a, an eye opener for me. Thank you. Especially okay. that uh, when two Jews have a halachic dispute and the house was previously owned by a Christian, that uh, the Beit Din decided that uh, some of the rights of the Christian were actually transferred and took precedence over halacha. Yeah. That is really an eye opener for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, again, that's, that's the context in which uh, Maharam, Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, invokes the Dina de Malchut, Dina principle. Um, and again, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's a very striking feature of those, of those responsa. I don't think I don't think I don't think it is. What uh, what uh, what evidence do we have of how the local authorities, to what extent the local authorities recognized uh, the autonomy of the Jewish courts? The autonomy of the Jewish what? Court. Oh, so that's 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 an excellent question. I mean, that's a that's a much larger question, um, but uh, that is a very important one. Um, I'm sorry that you didn't ask the question uh, earlier, because um, perhaps I should have really said something about that. Um, I actually did, but the, but the, I actually oh, okay. did. Well, thank you then for asking it now. <laughs> thank you for asking that now. Um, and just to answer, uh, really in brief, because it is a is the subject of a, of a you know a, of a great deal of research. Um, the Jewish communities had, they were granted in, in some of the, in the privileges that were given to, that really founded, you could say, some of the German Jewish communities, the privileges that they were granted by local authorities um, that gave them the rights of residence in these German cities and towns. One of the explicit rights that they were granted was the right to judge themselves, to judge their own members. Um, so the, the kind of, I think, autonomy that you're referring to. Um, so that was built into the system that was recognized. Um, now, it wasn't uh, an absolute across the board autonomy. Um, Jews generally had Jewish, Jews, Jewish courts, had the rights to judge their co-religionists in matters of civil law, in matters of religious law, um, but not usually in matters of high crime that was usually reserved for um, the local ruler. Um, even in the case of Jews. Um, but in all, but virtually all matters of, of civil and religious law, Jewish communities, Jewish courts had, um, had autonomy. That does not necessarily mean in practice that all Jews turned to Jewish courts to adjudicate these kinds of issues. In, to a large extent they did, um, but we also definitely know of many cases in which Jews, despite the fact that the Jewish communities had autonomy in these or had authority in these matters, um, chose to avail themselves of the, of the local Christian courts. Um, and again, this is part of the legal pluralism that I was referring to, this idea that we have different overlapping legal spheres that Jews were able to negotiate and take advantage of. Um, that they were able to, to a certain extent, um, sort of pick and choose. Um, so what, what legal scholars will call forum shopping. Um, they were able to choose the, um, the venues to which they applied, the laws um, that they desired to invoke um, to a certain extent. Um, that is to say that although the Jewish communities had autonomy, the local courts um, also recognized the rights of Jews, particularly in cases involving Jews and Christians, but even in cases involving Jews and Jews, to also apply to uh, local courts or to invoke local local law. And that's that's I think what we've seen in this particular example. This this is a striking striking example of that. Answer the question. <laughs> Are there still uh, independent Jewish courts that have these recognized rights in Europe? For example, I know that in uh, Germany there's a special tax on somebody who declares themselves Jews and their money goes to the Jewish community. I know that in Holland there are very high extra taxes for Jews uh, that belong to a Jewish community. And uh, I'm British originally, I mean I live in the line, but I'm British. I don't believe that's the case in Britain, but I do believe that in certain countries in Europe, these rights still exist. Yeah, so I think I just want to untangle a little bit of that. Um, I mean, generally speaking, this kind of autonomy of Jewish communities, Jewish courts that, that I was discussing just a moment ago, um, that more or less came to an end um, with, uh, with emancipation. Um, emancipation, uh, that is, you know, the, the gradual, 
acceptance of Jews as citizens of European countries in uh, 18th, 19th century, early 19th century, um, that more or less spelled the end of Jewish legal autonomy in those kinds of ways. Um, what you're referring to, the it, it is actually, it's usually referred to as a church tax. Um, it's true, um, and, and that does um, continue to exist in Germany until today. Um, but that's about um, individuals opt today. It's voluntary. Individuals opt into particular religious communities, and then um, kind of the, the government earmarks a portion of their taxes for the religious community. But it doesn't really have to do with um, legal autonomy as such. So I think that that's a separate issue. Thank you. If you, if you have time for one more question, yeah, sure. when you mentioned about the, as a German, as the empire expanded, the Jews were, uh, were, I guess they were forced out of the cities, I'm guessing, or they were out of the cities. How were they accepted in the small villages and towns or how did that work? Um, so that's a subject of a lot of really interesting research um, that some of my colleagues um, have done. Um, again, this is, we're talking now for the most part in the period of slightly later than the one that I was focusing on. Um, so right. we're talking about most of the, 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 the major expulsions of Jews really began at the end of the 14th century and, and happened over the course of the 15th century um, into the beginning of the 16th century. Um, and again, what it, what it again, it, it, first of all, it, um, in, it, it elicited or inspired, you could say, um, great waves of migration of German Jews, both eastward to Eastern Europe, um, as well as southward to Italy. Um, I just wanna be clear that again, when we're talking in Germany, there was no um, across the board expulsion of Jews the way that there was, for example, perhaps the most famous case of Spain and Portugal, right? That never happens in Germany. In Germany, because of the way that, the, because of the political arrangement, which was much more localized, um, the expulsions happened on a much more local level. So from individual towns rather than from the empire as a whole. Um, the, the political system didn't really allow for that. Um, now, again, while there were, this did precipitate major migrations of Jews out of Germany, um, there were also many Jews who stayed local. Um, and again, they left the cities where they had been expelled and they, they migrated, as I said, to the countryside, to these, um, you know, sort of rural uh, communities. Um, some of them continued to do business in the cities that they had presumably been expelled from. Um, so an interesting feature of midi uh, early modern, uh, you know, German urban life, you could say, is that Jews actually appear in the court records, for example, of cities where they presumably did not exist, where they had been expelled. Um, and this is a product, again, of the fact that Jews, many Jews lived in the countryside, but as I said, did business, moved, went into the cities during the day, even though, again, officially that was prohibited. But um, we know that it continued to happen. Um, how were they accepted in the rural communities? Again, that's, that's uh, you know, mm -hmm. first of all, it changed the nature of Jewish life dramatically. The German Jewish communities were never enormous. They were never of the size of the Jewish communities in the South, even during the period that I'm discussing and even in the big urban centers. Um, but nonetheless, when we talk about these rural communities, we're, we're talking about a handful mm -hmm. of families, if, if that much. Um, so obviously it changed the, the fabric of Jewish life very dramatically. Um, and that's, again, that's, that's a very interesting study in and of itself, as well as their acceptance by the local communities. Great. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Rachel, thank you so much. It was so enlightening. I have, I have another hour full of questions I could ask. <laughs> I hope we get to meet again um, by Zoom or otherwise. Very, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're, you're welcome to also look me up and to email any, any burning questions that you have after this <laughs> session is over. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all once more. And Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Laila Tov, thank you very much. Thank you for your help with all of this. Wonderful.